Hello fellow retro friends. While I was copying a floppy disk, the screen froze and started to show these strange patterns. This happened every time it was turned on or the reset button was pressed. In this video I am going to investigate the problem, desolder, remove chips, place new chips, maybe put them back and hopefully fix it. It is time to open it up and see what is going on. First thing is to remove the shield that blocks access to all of the nice electronics inside. This Mega ST is expanded with an 80 speed board. It was actually already broken, but I left it inside and maybe this caused the failure. Let's remove the disk drive. The Atari ST uses a double-sided double density floppy disk that is actually compatible with MS-DOS. Beneath the disk drive there are 16 1 megabit DRAM chips that make a total of 2 megabytes. To get full access to the motherboard the power supply needs to be removed as well. This exposes the Yamaha YM2149 chip that not only produces sound but is also responsible for selecting A and B drives. I have installed a mod which allows me to boot from an external B drive. We will come back to that later in the video. After visually inspecting the board, I connected it back. But this time the monochrome monitor was not showing any output. Did something else break down? I have swapped for a color monitor. And now the display was white with vertical stripes. This showed every time I pressed the reset button. I suspected that one or more of the DRAM chips had failed. So I started inspecting them by physically touching each one with my finger to determine if any of them were becoming hotter. However, this was not the case. But every time I touched one particular chip, the pattern of the stripes changed. Unfortunately, I did not have any spare 1 megabit chips to swap the faulty ones, so I have placed an ad that I was looking for an Atari Mega ST2 board. In the meanwhile, I have continued to investigate and remove the 80 speed board. That was easy as there was a socket soldered on top of the Motorola 68000 processor, but it did not make any difference. The expansion board also had the blitter chip patch soldered on top of it, but I thought that at this point there was no need in resoldering it back to the processor. I have also acquired an Atari diagnostic cartridge in the hopes that it might help me to troubleshoot. After booting from it, the screen looked a bit different, as it had a black background. So I'm guessing that some of the code from the cartridge is being executed. There is an option to troubleshoot a dead Atari ST using this cartridge and a serial connection, but it needs some investigation. And this would be my next step, but I got a message from someone that had a broken Atari Mega ST board and wanted to sell it for me for just 10 euros. That was an amazing offer and I was very happy about it. It was missing the blitter chip and the toss, but otherwise it looked pretty complete. It also had these nice golden ceramic DRAM chips on it. Would this board work? If so, maybe it could save me some trouble and I could just use the new board instead. Let's swap some components from our original board and see if we can get it working. First we can transfer the power supply. And then the toss chips. I did not have to swap the blitter chip as the Atari Mega ST2 should work without it, but I did it anyway. And just a white screen, but this also happens when you don't connect a floppy disk. We should connect it. After turning it on, there is still a white screen and no floppy disk activity. Oh well, it was worth trying out. I might come back to this board in the future, but for now, I will continue to troubleshoot my original board. Before desoldering the RAM chips, I wanted to try swapping some other chips that were already socketed on both boards. Maybe I would get lucky. First one was the DMA chip. On my board I had the M chip labeled C100110-001, while the other board featured a chip marked C025913-38. Fortunately, both chips are fully compatible with each other. I had noticed that someone already did a repair on this chip, as it had a solder wire on one of the pins. But there was no change. 
And actually, that makes sense as the DMA chip controls the floppy and hard disk drives. Next to the DMA is the shifter chip, which is responsible for the video output. A fun fact is that the IMP shifter chip on my board has a typo and is missing a 7. It should read C070713-002. The equivalent on the other board is C25914-38A. Let's replace them and test the output. Somehow the screen looks a bit different, but swapping this chip also did not fix anything. It's time to take the bottom part of the Atari Mega enclosure in order to gain access to the rest of the board. And you can probably guess what comes next. Exactly, we are going to desolder some chips. In my man cave I have connected the hose to the airbrush booth, which should effectively extract all the fumes that are produced during the desoldering process. Let's start with the DRAM chip that was changing the output on the screen when I touched it. Adding some solder to the chip will help desoldering it. I have set the temperature to 380 degrees Celsius. Desoldering should be easy now. This knife tip should help to loose the desoldering joints a bit more. And I am using a bit of desoldering wick on the other side of the board to suck up the remaining solder. And the chip does come loose except for the ground pin, which seems to be stuck. Eventually I heated up the soldering iron to 450 degrees and was successful in removing this chip. We will now need a replacement chip, same thing, first adding some solder to the pins. Then I'm using the desoldering gun again and it won't budge. I have added some flux, used a desoldering wick Change the soldering tip and increase the temperature. Nope, none of those methods worked. I've posted it on Twitter and got a lot of responses. The reply that appealed to me came from Devzyme, who gave me a tip to try using a heat gun. I was a bit anxious about it, but since they are ceramic chips, they should be able to withstand the heat. I have set the temperature of the heat gun to 380 degrees and covered up the plastic parts on the board next to the chip using a Kapton tape. Who said that repairing retro computers does not make use of space technology? The solder started to melt like it was made of butter and the DRAM chips began to come loose. Ok, let's turn on the computer without the chip that we have just desoldered. The screen looks as before, that is promising. It's time to solder a socket and try the replacement chip. Hmm, it seems that it was not the fix. Maybe another DRAM chip is broken. I just remembered that you don't need to desolder the DRAM chip in order to check if it's faulty. You can also piggyback a working chip on top of it. So let's try the piggybacking technique on the other DRAM chip. It's working now. So this chip was broken then, right? Let's put the first chip back to confirm that it is still working. I have also inserted the diagnostic cartridge and it boots up nicely. Before desoldering the broken DRAM chip, I have removed the piggyback chip and booted the Atari. It is working now? What? So none of the memory chips are broken then? Let's do a RAM test. It all checks out. Maybe it was a cold joint that was responsible for all of this. Let's try to do a timing test. And that seems to fail. The error message indicates that there is something wrong with the memory controller. Why don't we try swapping the memory controller from the other board and see if that resolves the issue. My board has the IMP chip. The other board has the C025912-38 chip. They should be interchangeable. How about we boot from the diagnostic cartridge again and conduct another timing test. It's green, so it was a faulty MMU in the end. The last thing that remains is adding that blitter patch back to the Motorola processor. There is a precision socket soldered on top of the CPU. Why don't we proceed with desoldering the patch from the AT speed board and change the pin header to one that has rounded pins. It will fit perfectly like this. The only thing remaining is to solder it. I will just do it on top of the CPU should do no harm. In order to ensure everything is working, we should run a full test. All checks out. Another issue has emerged. After the boot, no floppy drives are showing up. 
This happens when no drives are connected, but this is not the case. Let's check the voltages. The floppy drive has a 12 and 5 volts connection, and both voltages are coming through from the power supply. To make sure that the floppy drive is not faulty, I have connected the floppy drive emulator, but this one is also not working. In addition, I have examined all the leads of the floppy drive connector, off camera, and they were all ok. The other thing that I could think of was the Yamaha YM2149 chip. On the Atari ST, it not only produces sound, but also selects the active disk drives. As I mentioned earlier, I have made a boot switch, so now I'm guessing that it might have broken the chip. Before anything else, let's start by desoldering it. Additionally, I must admit that I did a sloppy job with this mod by simply cutting the pins off the motherboard. Let's remove the remaining solder on top of the chip and pry it loose. After desoldering it, it is a good practice to clean the board with some IPA. We can now solder a 40 pin socket. And reconnect this jumper wire. Not sure if this was part of the PCB revision or just a fix of a broken trace. I have some YM2149 spare chips, so let's use one of them and plug it into the socket. While at it, I have found this ugly connection of wires that was asking for a short. Let's do a quick fix. And now after connecting the floppy drive, it boots correctly. Although we are done by now, I was curious if the Yamaha chip was broken or maybe it had some bad connection or something like that. I did check that before desoldering it, but maybe I missed something. So I have decided to reconnect it using a method that I have done in the past by using removed pins from a socket. To summarize, I soldered them to the wires that used to connect to the motherboard and then plugged them inside the socket. Then I masked them with a piece of electrical tape and put the old chip back in its place. The switch on the A position should boot from the disk drive. And it does. Then flip it to boot from the external B drive and that works as well. Apparently the chip was ok and there was a loose connection, maybe even a cold joint. Once the repair is complete, what remains to be done? I suppose indulging in some retro gaming would be a fitting choice. Thank you for watching this video, I hope you found it enjoyable and perhaps even gained some new insights. If you liked it, please consider subscribing and hitting the like button. I look forward to seeing you in the next video.